Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, goal scorers. It's time again to strap on your boots, lather up in liniment, and go hunting for the back of the net once again. You're taking the field front and centre once again with Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. And you are welcome. Yes, sirree. And we are nothing but rudderless, with no guidance or direction without that one person to tie the team together from the sideline. So here to point us all to the prize is our unwavering coach, Mr. Matthew Dickerson. What do you know, Matt? Well, what I know is something that I got pretty excited about this week. Talk about hit the back of the net. Talk about scoring a goal. <laughs> there is one electricity provider that I stumbled across just having a conversation with someone at a function. And they've got a new plan, and I got a bit excited about this new plan. Normally, it's like you sold it already, like you're excited <laughs> by an electricity plan. Well, and this is what I'm saying. Normally, it's not the sort of thing that I go looking through the different energy providers and go, "Oh, look Ooh. at that!" <laughs> but this one got me excited. Now, you'd be well and truly aware, and most of our listeners would be aware that the whole concept of off-peak electricity was designed because they couldn't just flick the switch on coal-fired power station yeah. back in the day and say. Oh, no one's using power between, say, midnight and 6am, so we'll just stop production of power. They had to keep the coal-fired power station running, and you can only vary the power slowly. So you can't just throttle it back a bit and then mm. throttle it up again when you need the power. So they introduced off-peak to obviously even out that supply of electricity. Bit of a carrot for the consumer. Exactly right, and keep it running through the middle of the night. So your hot water system, for example, or slab heating or whatever it might be, things mm. that you could use off-peak. So some people have said, oh, no, we need that base load power, and that's all a bit silly because it was created because of coal-fired power stations. We've got the opposite problem now where typically we have too much power in the middle of the day because we've got sun and there is... Oh, of course, with solar panels. That's right. So there are large solar producers out there, and there are... Actually, I saw one the other day. There was a new proposal going in somewhere around us that will be an 840-megawatt solar farm, solar panel farm. So there are Mm. some fairly large ones out there. But what do you do with all that excess power? Well, it's actually fascinating going into the control room of some of these renewable energy providers. On the wall, typically, there'll be a five-minute spot price. So every five minutes, it changes how much they're getting paid for the electricity. And there are times when that price goes negative. (laughs) And I'm going to sit there going... Well, I don't, I don't understand. You're producing power and you've got to pay to pay it into the grid. That doesn't yeah. make sense. And, of course, it doesn't make sense. So they try and do something else, maybe put it into a battery, pump water uphill, do other things with that power during that time because who wants to pay to mm. put power into the grid? But all this excess power, so one energy company has come up with a brilliant idea, which I absolutely love. Step one, you've got to prove you've got an EV. So that shouldn't be too hard. You've got a few steps Sounds you like go to go through. Sounds like an incentive. And then, if you do that, you can choose their EV-friendly plan, which has got normal peak rates, off-peak rates, but it's got a special rate between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. every day, where the rate then is zero. What? Not off-peak, cheap. Free electricity. (laughs) Free electricity. That's unheard of. The first question I asked was, well, how do you do that? Do you have to have a separate meter to plug into your EV? What, what do you do? I was a bit confused. I said, no, no, no. It's free for your household. So do the dryer, do the washing, put the dishwasher on, whatever. Put the pool pump on. Whatever electricity well, you use between 10 and, fr- and 3 is free. Yeah, because most people will be driving their EV to work and probably not working from home. Correct. But it still works on weekends. So ah. if you want to charge your EV between yeah, right. 10 and 3 on a weekend would be the time to do it. And most people I know, including myself, charge their EV up once every week, maybe once every couple of weeks, depending on how often you're driving it. You're probably not charging it every day. And some people do work from home. So sure, you could charge it up maybe during the, the day at those times. Yeah, but even still, I mean, you the money you save on running your other stuff you know, during that 10 till 3 time... Um, yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you plug it in at night or in the afternoon. And Probably not the end of the world if every now and again you've got to pay for it. But yeah. this whole concept is just yeah, wow. unbelievable. So there you go. They've designed this system. So rather than have all this power that they're having to pay to put back into the grid, this particular company said, well, if we use it some other way to attract clients, and obviously that's their end game is to attract more clients, well, free electricity, that might attract a few more clients, and then obviously we'll make money the other times of the day when they're using it. So there you go. So I often talk about if you really 
focused on getting free power for your EV. You can plug into some of the free charges and all this sort of thing, but I never <laughs> did I think you just <laughs> have normal power at home for free. And, yeah, uh, amazing great. stuff. All right, folks, pay attention closely. This next story is likely to bring some extra cash in your next tax return. There's a big list of tech products that are potentially claimable, but take heed that it's not totally open slather, folks. Here's Matt with a list of what's fair game at tax time. Now, I just have to say that I'm not an accountant. I'm not giving official tax advice. (laughs) But Take take advice from your accountant. But it was interesting because I did see an assistant commissioner to the ATO who was talking about some of the things that people had tried to claim and some of the things that they were successful with and maybe not so successful. Yeah, right. So some of these are bogus claims. Some of these are ones that I would say don't waste your time and the tax man's time. I always say to my accountant, I don't want to pay extra tax, but I don't really want to step over the line and have the tax man knocking on my door. So err on the side of it's not quite over the line rather than, yeah, sure, we'll just blast past that line and (laughs) and hope hope we don't get picked up on it. And that's what I'm going for here is things that let's not step over the line. So, for example, if you had a music subscription, and this is one that has been attempted to be claimed a number of times, a music subscription to Spotify, Apple Music, whatever it might be, and you're a farmer – well, you're sitting on the tractor mm. and you're ploughing your paddock, so it seems reasonable you need some music to listen to. So a lot of farmers apparently try and claim their Spotify or their music subscriptions. The taxman says, no, that's ah. not a legitimate claim. Same with your Netflix or Apple TV subscriptions. While I'm sitting on the self-driving tractor, well, I've got to have something to keep me awake so I can turn around at the end of each row. No, sorry, that's not a reasonable claim either. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so it comes down to the necessity, I suppose, of generating yeah, an income. Okay. So w- then we start to look at some other things. For example, a second screen on your notebook or on your PC at home. Oh, well, that's got to be claimable, surely. If you're using that to generate income, sure. So if you're a teacher, for example, doing some plans for your students, then using the computer, second screen, if you can justify that you need that to do your job better, sure. If you need the second screen for the times that you play games on your computer, maybe not so much. (laughs) Wi-Fi extenders is another one that the ATO has said is a common thing that they see claimed. And again, it depends why you need that Wi-Fi extender. The kids down in the bedroom need to be able to play their games? No. Do their homework? No. But you happen to have the office down one end of the house where you need to do some work for your gainful employment? Yeah, sure. Put it in, and that'll be a reasonable claim. Again, asterisk there. Check with your accountant. <laughs> Don't say to the tax man, well, Tech Talk said, so it's all okay. So lots of things like that. Obviously, laptops, mobile phones, they're a really good one. Many people get supplied their mobile phone by their employer, and there's a reason they do that. In normal circumstances, their fringe benefits tax exempt. Mm. So that means the employer can provide it, they can claim that 100%, and the employee doesn't have to worry about tracking every phone call and making sure that X percentage of it is used for work-related purposes, like they have to do with their car, for example. But the problem is that some people get supplied a mobile phone from their workplace, and then that person wants to make a claim on their personal income tax as well, even Uh, though they haven't paid for the mobile phone themselves. So that's a no-no. Claiming the mobile phone in the first place, sure, whoever's paying for it can do that, but when you're trying to double dip, the tax man takes a dim view of the double dipping scenario, gotcha. as, as you can imagine. So other things, for example, that you might look at, uh, headsets. Now, this is a good one. When you've got your headset, your earbuds, that type of thing on, because you're using it for Zoom calls from home as part of your job, you might now work from home. Sure, if you need that to do your job, that's fine. But putting it on because you want to go for a run and listen to music, again, probably not so much. But then maybe if you're an Olympic athlete Ah. and training was part of what you did to gain employment or to generate an income – then maybe you could probably get away with that one. I'm uh, I'm not convinced of that, but yeah, I reckon there'd all be right, a reason. All you argument. Olympic athletes out there, <laughs> that's right. They're all listeners, obviously, to to Tech Talk. So one of the things that the ATO really scrutinised in previous years was around cryptocurrencies. Just getting to the point where they were trying to work out how people were gaining income and how they were declaring that income. Ah. I think one of the advertisements that people often had with cryptocurrencies was that you kept it out of the mainstream. So maybe yeah, that's you had to it. <laughs> the ATO that was, was a big incentive that it was going to be all that money that no one was going to need to know about. Yeah, that's right. And, and it sounds like an illegal incentive to me. But that was one thing they really focused on in the past. But I think they've gotten past that now and cryptos, well, it's probably not that important anymore because people aren't making money on cryptos mm. anymore. So now I think really it comes down to they'll be cracking down a little 
little bit on some of those tech products. The other one that I, I see a lot advertised, even in the Kmarts and Targets, everyone seems to be selling them at the moment, are the ring lights. So the circular light, and you mount your phone in the middle for all those influencers out there mm. that need to be able to have their lighting on their face absolutely perfect. For those, if you're doing it because you just want to look good on Instagram, yeah, probably not able to be claimed. But if you are an influencer that generates income from your looking good on Instagram, sure, you can go and claim that. So seems to be a common theme here, doesn't there? If you can justify it to generate an income, then sure. People have claimed things like sofas because they have to sit comfortable in their sofa on their Zoom call. The ATO says... Probably not. You're probably stretching it a bit there. You've got to justify that the sofa was needed for you to do your job. If a chair would still do the job for you, then probably not. So I'm sure you'd be able to claim desk chairs and things like that. Things like that in your office, sure. I suppose when it gets to a lounge chair that you use yeah. 98% of the time to sit back and watch the latest movie. My desk chair is just very low set and extremely comfortable. Well, and I can very low on. set in that case. <laughs> That's right. So if you can tell a good enough story, sure. But as I say, I try to get the tax man away from my door. So it's an interesting time around tax time. But again, go and talk to your accountant. But there's probably lots of things that people don't think about claiming that are in the tech world that you can probably justify as part of your job. Here's a story that brings a modern twist to the romantic era of 150 years ago. A time of tall wooden ships out sailing on the cruel sea. Now, drawing inspiration from a time when the most efficient way was to get around oh, to get around the world was in an 180 foot schooner, in glorious full sail. Modern nautical engineers are looking to reduce emissions from f- maritime transport, and they're turning back the clock. Wind power on the water is set to make a glorious return, and Matt has the details. Not so much the old timber masts and the cloth sails as you're thinking of, which is exactly what I thought of. ropes and rigging and all that sort of stuff. All that sort of fun stuff. These are a little bit different. This one in particular, there's a few ways to go about it. I'll talk about a few of them. The retrofit is the first way. And the retrofit is a 40 metre high sail weighing 200 tonnes. So probably not the sort of thing that you just Mm. unfurl (laughs) and pull out the ropes for. But it stands like a, a vertical piece of metal, but it's it's obviously curved and shaped in just the right way to catch as much wind as possible. Just by installing one of those, the testing they've been doing already can save fuel consumption on a ship by about 10%. Now, some of these ships, we're talking about large ships here, some of these ships will use around 6 or 7 million litres of diesel a year. Mm. So save 10%, there's six or 700,000 litres of diesel. That's quite significant. It is. Now, I can't imagine that a 40 metre high, 200 metre, a 200 tonne sail is that cheap, but I think you probably get your money back reasonably quickly in terms of that. So that's 10% with that. Now, the good part about those is they pop up when they need them, so the wind happens to be behind them, they pop them up. The wind's not behind them, they fold them down again. They're going under bridges, for example, they can fold them down. So they can fold up and down hydraulically rather than with some ropes quite easily. But then they started looking at designing ships with these sails as part of the ship, as the overall ship design. How can we make this ship more aerodynamic? It's not something you normally worry about. Cars you do because they're going 100 k's an hour. But with ships, you're typically going along at maybe 15, 20 knots, so they're not so fast that you're trying to make them more aerodynamic. But if you start to think about the resistance of the water and obviously the the wind there as well, they believe that some of the other ships they can build from the ground up, and we're talking about ships here, 200 metre long ships designed to transport cars, for example. Big ships. 60%. They reckon they can get the reduction down, so 60% really? efficiency savings by building these sails into the ship from the ground and making the ship overall more efficient. So your six or seven million litres of diesel you might burn then take 60% off that. That starts to make a pretty big dent. That's an enormous savings for the company that's trying to ship as well. Exactly right. And again, shipping is one of those things that we think will solve some of our carbon emissions around cars with electric vehicles. That's great. But Mm. ships are a bit harder because they travel so far between anywhere they can refuel. There's no refueling spots in the middle of the Pacific or the Atlantic, for example. So you're having to go a long way. So we think that hydrogen, we've talked about it before, hydrogen might be a solution. But in the meantime, while they're getting that sorted out, some people are being quite clever. And then even if you do get to the stage where you have hydrogen, well, 
it still costs money to put hydrogen in. So if you had a more fuel efficient ship, whatever that fuel might be, then that doesn't sound like such a bad thing anyway. So there's lots of people working on this. The um, international shipping or maritime organisation, the IMO, is trying to get to the stage where they're going to cut emissions in half by 2050. Now, a lot of organisations are saying net zero by 2050, but the IMO just doesn't see how they'll get to that point. So they're being more realistic, but this is one of the ways they think they'll cut a lot of those CO2 emissions, all those carbon emissions by using sails on ships, which is not the first thing you'd think of. No, that's right. But um, if it's really interesting. If people want to check out what it looks like, um, what should they Google? Wing Sail 560 is one of the companies out there doing it. Wing Sail, as, as it sounds, W I N G S A I L 560 is one of the prototypes they're actually installing on ships as we speak. And so that gives you an idea of just this big thing, this big, it's almost like a mast with a bit of width about it that yeah. just pops up out of nowhere. And uh, there's about five or six that, that string along the boat there. That, um... Well, they're starting with some of these with just one. Oh, really? And okay. just putting one on the ship because the ship wasn't really designed from the ground up to have all this extra weight, weight on top on of top. it. Yeah. And again, you can imagine you stick 200 tonnes sticking straight up, and of course you get in the strong winds, they can drop it back down again, but you're normally relying on some weight in the hull to stop yeah. the ship from capsizing. You stick a whole bunch of weight straight up, then that suddenly becomes a bit of a problem, And which is where I say that some of the ships that they're designing from the ground up are going to be better, because logically I think what they'll do with those is probably have a few sails along the ship, but again they'll design it with the deck able to handle those sails along the ship there. So yeah, right. yeah fascinating times, but I just love the ingenuity people. They They sometimes do look back to the past and see – how did they do it all those years ago? Let's see if we can steal some of those ideas. Yeah, very good. You'll never make money playing video games is that parent parental advice that is ageing like milk. My apologies to parents who are looking for that hook to draw their, your young and away from the Xbox, but these words are becoming more and more of a lie each day. The eSport Arena... It just keeps on expanding and expanding and young aspiring folk can now do a degree course in esports and earn a lucrative position in operations in the multi-billion dollar industry. Matt, esports have become so much more than a pastime for easily distracted adolescents. Now, my son does listen to Tech Talk, so can you just turn off for the next five minutes, please? <laughs> because exactly as you said, stop playing games, go and do something that's going go to be a good career for useful. you. Yeah. <laughs> but with esports around, there are, there are some of these athletes. I'm, I'm not sure if athletes is the right word, but let's call them athletes for the time being. <laughs> if uh, the want of an, another substitution, yeah. <laughs> some of them are earning seven-figure sums playing yeah. esports. Sounds incredible. <laughs> and, of course, that's all well and good. That's a nice hobby to my that's son. a very small number of a large group of people, isn't it? It is. That's absolutely correct. Okay, but, that, but, that's the message. But you want something that's useful. Go and get a, an education, son. Yeah, but now right. you can get a degree in esports. Now, my first impression is that, what, three years playing games? That sounds pretty fantastic. <laughs> but they have actually thought about it a bit more than just playing games for three years. It's two years and nine months of playing games. No, no I'm sure it's, <laughs> it's much more sensible than that. They actually look into a, a range of things. So behind-the-scenes roles Yeah, so so in order to get this big organism to work, this esports organism, they, it's just like any other sport, that they need a whole lot of other people making it all happen. And when you think about it, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it. When you think about athletes going through in what I'd call more traditional sports, and if you had a friend or one of your children that said, oh, I've been selected to go to AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport, isn't that fantastic? Mm. You'd be very proud of them. Absolutely. In this case, you go, well, you can get a degree and keep playing that sport you love. So we should be very proud, but I'm just not convinced. It just, <laughs> just, I'm it's going gonna, to get a degree it'll in It'll be e-sports. a while before it aspires the same sort of uh, uh, pride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I always think about the telling of your grandparents. Go and tell your grandparents how well you're going at school or whatever it might be, but go and tell your grandparents that you're doing that's a degree true. in playing sports really on a computer. <laughs> good at video games. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But they do do some things in behind-the-scenes stuff. So they go and look at organising a tournament. How do you go about that? Because you can just imagine the logistics of organising one of these tournaments. Huge job. So they learn about that. They learn about the mental health and well-being of some of these esports players. Same with any occupation that's got high pressure associated with it, whether it be a sport or any occupation, Mm. then there are some people who suffer some pretty severe mental concerns around that. So they work on that so that when these people come out of this three-year degree, it doesn't necessarily mean that all they're going to do is go and play esports they might find as they're going through their degree that they're not actually quite as good as they thought they were so they can't earn those seven figure seven figure sums they might Mm. be able to 
earn a few dollars, maybe earn nothing, but what am I going to do for a career? Well, there are people who obviously organise it. There are people who manage teams, for example, put teams together, go and get sponsors. So all these other behind-the-scenes roles, not just the people playing the games. So I don't mind that well, idea Well, they get either. big crowds to come and watch. So oh. assuming you've got to have big screens to be able to watch those as well, so there's a lot of IT support that's required there, I'm guessing. Yeah, and even this is over at Angus College in Dundee in the UK, and, for example, part of this whole process they're doing to make the university stand out in this arena is they're building a 4,000-seat eSports arena dedicated for their students, obviously, and they'll be able to organise tournaments there and get practice organising all that and the mm. technology behind the screens. But part of the reason for all of this is that the industry, you mentioned billions there, you're spot on, the industry is projected to be worth $1.9 by the year 2025. Wow. So. This we, we kind of laugh about it now or scoff at it a little bit, but maybe Dundee in the UK is way ahead of the rest of us, and this will be something that the University of New South Wales and University of Sydney will be running esports degrees in before we know it, and here we are, little old Dundee over in the UK is leading the way for the rest of the we'll world. We'll be having esports arenas built in our big city centres and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, wait and see. Well, it's official. People will watch absolutely anything. You too can be one of the 40.2 million viewers who've already tuned into YouTube to catch 24 hours of black screen in HD. Who knows? That number may have swollen to even more by now, but you can check it out for yourself or just take my word for it and not waste any of your precious time. 24 hours of black screen, and importantly, folks, in high definition. Matt, have we just stopped trying here? I actually went and checked it out. You did? To see <laughs> the difference between... I am just I was taking your word for it. <laughs> ...between the high definition version, and I did find... Oh, and the standard, standard <laughs> definition wasn't as good. Well, I was struggling, I must admit, and I was only looking at it on my computer screen. I didn't go and put yeah. it on the TV, yeah. but I did struggle to pick a lot of difference between the HD... Was there any sound? No, 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 there was no sound. It's just as the name suggests, and I like the... Advertising, the truth in advertising here. The name of this YouTube video is 24 Hours of Pure Black Screen in HD. And that's what you got. Now, I had to watch the full 24 hours to make sure there wasn't a little Easter egg somewhere in there. Yeah. That maybe at the 12 hour mark, you had a little surprise. I didn't want to miss any of those things. So, the dedication I give to Tech Talk, James, 24 hours, I watched that. At, at what point does insanity kick in? <laughs> I reckon about the two-hour mark. Yeah, I reckon pretty early. <laughs> it's a bit like solitary confinement. <laughs> oh, I think me. maybe it's like going for a, a long run. You start yeah. off and you're in extreme pain for the first kilometre or two. Yeah, right. And then you just become accustomed to that extreme pain, and yeah. then that's normal. So just right out the, the extreme time. boredom <laughs> cuts in pretty soon, and then you just stay at that level. But if you don't like that idea, there are most colours available as well. So you can oh, have 24 good. hours of white. 24 hours of green, 24 hours of red. And if you did want a bit of sound, you can go and watch 10-hour videos of goats bleating. Oh. 24 hours of, say, for example, Minecraft gaming, oh. just streaming. So I do get some of them. Some of the ones that are interesting, you can have 24 hours of roaring fire. So that's fine. You want to be good to the environment and you want to have yeah. a romantic night. And then you put that on the TV, like in the Tesla, when you can put a, a romantic fire <laughs> on the screen in the Tesla. You put that on the screen and it's a nice 24 hours of... The, there's something romantic about yeah. the fire, but I don't like burning. And you might be pottering around the house by yourself and it's just nice to have a fire burning somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Or so have it on your telly. Or spa music, all these sort of things. So people create these videos... And I thought, sure, it's pretty funny to do that. But as you said, that one that I watched when I when I actually did this research, forty point two million. But you'd be spot on. There would be more than that now. If you went and searched it right now, you'd find more than that. And so I started thinking, okay, maybe there's some reason here, <laughs> apart from giving us something inane to talk about. Yeah. Sure, there's going to be some reason. And I did find some reasons. Some people said they obviously don't understand the computers that well. But some people said I needed something to run on my computer because I was downloading a large game, I didn't have a great internet connection, and I didn't want my computer to go to sleep. Now, there are settings you can change uh, to stop yeah, your computer yeah. going to sleep, but that was the reason some people ran it, for example. I run this, my computer thinks it's doing something, it's running a YouTube video. So it thinks it's doing something, therefore it doesn't go to sleep, doesn't shut down the screen. Other people had similar problems where they had the computer in their bedroom, and they wanted their computer to keep 
processing something, doing something overnight, but they didn't want the screen on. Now, I did think they could just turn the screen off, but apparently that wasn't <laughs> an option. So they put 24 hours of pure black. So they had. It's just a different way of solving the same problem. <laughs> exactly right. Now, probably the one I enjoyed the most, and I don't recommend this, but I thought the one that was the most entertaining reason is that some people have got their work from home arrangements set up such that their employer can track their usage on the computer. But they don't track exactly what they're doing, just the fact that they're doing something. Uh. Now, apparently, when you're running a YouTube video, that is enough to make the tracker on your computer think that something's happening. So some people said, I just put that on. I go to the beach for the day, come home. My boss thinks <laughs> I've been working hard all day. Meanwhile, it's been 24 hours of black screen. Were these all in the comments section? Yes. Yeah, yes. right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume that was a person who didn't use their real name because their boss might look at it and go, yeah, that's hold right. on a second, I've noticed you haven't been that productive when you've been at home, but I've been tracking it. You're actually doing stuff on the computer. 40.2 million views. Yeah, that's right. So this is some of the absurdity we get. Mm. When they posted the first video, Me at the Zoo, in the very first YouTube video, I guarantee that if someone said then, hey, someone will make a video that's 24 hours of pure black screen, they would have said, don't be crazy. Shut up and get out. That's right. <laughs> this is so, like that famous artwork, which is just a piece of A4 paper screwed up into a ball and placed on uh, a mount. It was uh, it's like, you did what? Yeah. Now that's worth how much? <laughs> Well, well, interestingly enough, with the, the Archibald finalist exhibition is, is on here at our local cultural centre. And interesting that I spoke to the creator, a curator of that the other day, and just talking about how different artworks invoke different emotions, etc. And I said, I remember when we started Kubla Khan at school, the poem Kubla Khan, and our English teacher said, well, when he was writing this, he was meaning this and blah, blah. And I said, hold on a sec, I thought he wrote this when he was high on opioids and he had no <laughs> idea what he was actually saying. And of course, I was in a lot of trouble for my English teacher because no, he knew exactly the, the <laughs> different imagery that he was creating from these particular words he was using. But there was this particular curator said there was an artwork that she was talking to the artist about one day and there was doing a, a kind of an interview. And one person in the audience said, oh, I really loved how you did this and that artwork and did this and I loved that emotion and that was really meaningful to me. And the artist said, wow. Never thought about that. Yeah. <laughs> I just painted this, but it's, I'm glad you're getting these emotions out of it. And this curator is going, oh, wow, all these things we thought about, these artists being really deep and meaningful. No, some of them just paint stuff. So. See, Mark Twain did a similar thing, and we're, we're digressing here. But uh, Mike, Mark Twain, he said um, he wrote a story about a boy having adventures on a river, um, and he meets uh, an escaped slave, um, and that's what it was about. But that text has been studied and studied and studied and pulled apart to, you know, to bits. And he said, well, if you can get an extra message out of it, good for you. Well That's done. Right. And if you think I'm really <laughs> clever because I wrote all those things in there. When, even better. Even better. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that the solar cells on your roof are the run-of-the-mill, flat, rigid silicon sort. Folks, they are so 2022 and are soon to be regarded as old school. Now, we've talked about developments in solar tech a bit here at Tech Talk. And as we hurtle towards the next decade, you may like to know that the next generation of solar power cells, they're going to be bendy because bendy means more resilient and lighter and just better all round. Matt, it's time to flex over some nifty new solar tech. Flex indeed. Yes. And this is a bit of the holy grail here because, as you said, most solar panels that people have got on their rooftops are fairly heavy and they're fairly thick and they're definitely not flexible. They're pretty solid. They don't like things that hit them, like hail, for example, mm. that aren't that flexible either. So that's all well and good. We've got those. We've got to a level of efficiency with solar panels that is probably getting close to the theoretical maximum. Most solar panels, maybe 24 25%. The experts really say 30% is the absolute yeah, maximum. Yeah, I thought 30% was the number. Yeah. So we've seen people try and come up with some flexible panels. And you'll know at your school, we've seen a Tesla put up there that had a solar panel rolled up in the boot and mm. they unfurled that. And that was fascinating. But the University of Newcastle researchers who were working on that said the efficiency of that was pretty low. So even though they'd solved the flexibility side, they hadn't really solved the efficiency side. Well, the holy grail is to get that same efficiency and add the flexibility. And some researchers from the Chinese Academy of Sciences have gotten to the point now where they think they've nailed it. They've got solar panels that are 95% lighter than rigid cells. They're flexible, probably not to the roll-up in a sleeve-type 
scenario like we saw with that example at your school, but certainly flexible. They can so bend around a reasonable surface yeah, right. and still retain essentially most of their power generation. Because currently we're just looking for a really flat, broad space to yeah. plonk these things. And so if you can just have a broad space that doesn't have to be flat, then... Uh, and yeah. you, you get some things then when you think, well, okay, that's great. It's flexible. How can that be used? Well, obviously, on a roof, you normally put them, say, on, on one side, but you could start to put them over different shape roofs. Well, domes, that sort of thing. Well, that's not yeah. that exciting, but reasonable. But then you start to think of things like the top of a car. Now, the surface area that you've got on the top of a car is probably not enough to generate a lot of power. But even if you had solar panels over all of it and they are fairly cost-effective, well, even if it generated a little bit of power, well, that sounds okay, unless mm. you're using the 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. free power scenario. <laughs> but then, of course, you start to think about other things. Now, you remember that Google had some experiments they were doing with a company they created called Loom, where they had balloons they put up in the air to provide internet connectivity to people in areas that didn't have great internet. But the balloon stayed up there for so long and it needed some power to transmit internet and it also needed some way of keeping it up in the air. But start to imagine the surface of a balloon with a flexible solar panel coating it. Yeah, right. Now you've got a fair surface area with the balloon. So straight away you go, well, we've got a fair few solar panels there. And then the power that generates could be used to try and keep the balloon up in the air, but also to provide power for the devices that you're powering down on the ground. So actually transmitting some electronic signals down to the ground. So you start to get to that point. And the researchers had a few examples, but what I loved about it, and this is what I love about new products all the time, the researchers said, I don't think we actually know the ways this will be used. We thought it's a problem that needs to be solved and some other people will come along and they'll adapt our solution to some other particular problem that we yeah, don't know Yeah, that's what we exists. love about tech, isn't it? Yeah. That, uh, that something that a product is designed for isn't necessarily the thing that it's going to be used for. Yeah, and I'll quote from the researchers. They said, this research paves the way for numerous potential applications of silicon, including those not yet considered. Mm. And I thought, that's exactly, that's the nail on the head there. So... Good scenario. Good to see people still working on solar panels and trying to adapt them and use them in different ways. But I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how this will be used in the future. The numbers are in, people, and worldwide car sales stats have a story to tell in 2023. Now, we've talked about the winds of change and how they're blowing in the modern car market. But Matt, Tesla have something to crow about now. We've talked about the fact that Tesla's the best-selling EV company and the Model 3 was going well and the Model Y came along and knocked it out of the park. And so it's all a bit boring and ho-hum now. Tesla wins everything, of course. But this is a bit more exciting. Tesla's now not just winning in their own little category. In the EV category. In They're the now... EV category, which is a small category. I accept that. So being the best-selling car in a small category, you go, well, you know, who cares about that? Some people go, big deal. But now... The first quarter of this year, January to March 2023, the Tesla Model Y was the number one selling model, all players, all cars, whatever you want, go. of all the cars in the world. Wow. So this is significant. They yeah, sold yeah. 267,200 Model Ys in the first quarter. Number two spot was the Toyota Corolla. 256,400. So a long way in front, not just sneaking past by a couple there, a long way in front. Now, there was a prediction a few years ago that the Tesla Model Y would be a, a million car a year seller in a fairly short period of time. Well, at 267,200 in one quarter, multiply that by four, then mm. there's your million straight away. So that's pretty interesting. Now, part of the problem here is that this is one individual model. Number one, fantastic. That's a real breakthrough across the world. Numbers two, three, four, and five were all ICE vehicles, and they all happen to be Toyotas as well. <laughs> so that's a, a bit of a problem, but it just gives you an idea that the Corolla being number one for so long, then it gives you an idea that there are some changes happening. Now, in terms of the increase, take the first quarter last year, compared to the first quarter this year for the Tesla Model Y, 69% increase year on year. Now, that's a fairly significant increase. So it gives you an idea of just what's happening across the world. So Tesla's doing it. Tesla's been there for a while, but they're still nowhere near the top manufacturers overall. If you look at all the car manufacturers, they're only number 19. Mm. So there's some other 
what I would call more traditional manufacturers that are in front of them in terms of total volume. But some of those are changing as well. So Volkswagen is obviously one that's up there in terms of a, a large global manufacturer. And they've obviously got a really strong EV strategy. Ford is up there as well. So you've got some other car companies that are going for their EVs. Probably the only one that sits up there that's a large global manufacturer that really doesn't quite get the EV concept yet is Toyota. But surely at some stage... They're going to have to, aren't they? They're going to see this movement. Well, wasn't say, Toyota looking to, to branch into hydrogen? They were going to actually try and focus more on hydrogen rather than um, uh, the traditional EV. Well, I've got a hypothesis on that. I think that someone sat around in the boardroom and said, hey, guys, this EV thing, it seems to be going fairly strong. We are about a decade behind our other competitors what are we going to do oh, i know let's go and try and sell the world on hydrogen and we'll start a hydrogen research now mm. so when finally in another decade when hydrogen might be the go then we'll say that we've been market leaders all the time and we skipped over the ev argument altogether well they have been also branding themselves on their ads a little bit sneakily saying they've been on electric vehicles for a long time mm. as hybrid vehicles yeah. and hybrid vehicles are good as we've talked about but, um, yeah, it's still a way to go. Yeah, that's right. So, anyway, I thought this was big news. I thought this was exciting news. And if people aren't thinking about it, in fact, I did think about when we were at school, when you were sitting around and someone would tell you some tale of woe and you wanted to tell them you had a care factor very low, you'd pull a, an imaginary 20 cents out of your pocket <laughs> or how much a payphone call was in the day, and you'd say, here you go, go and call someone who cares. And I use that a little bit sometimes when people yeah. talk to me, and not saying that I don't care, but talk to me about they'll never get an EV. They hear these stats or they hear me talk about, I'll never get an EV. And I kind of pull an imaginary 50 cents out of my pocket and say, here you go, give me a call in five years' time when you're driving an EV. Mm. Oh, I'll never have one of those. Mm. But people who have said that to me already in the past – have bought one. I've got people who have actually rung me and have said, you know what? I thought you were an idiot, but now it actually turns <laughs> out you did know what you're talking about. I've actually, I'm sitting in my EV driving along talking to you now and I go, yeah. well, I'll give you that 50 cents now for that phone call. So yeah, yeah it's changing. And, and as much as people want to deny it, it's changing. And in this country, we are lagging a bit across the world, but wow, look at that. Number one selling car is an EV. Well, sales are picking up here in Australia slowly. And as those sales pick up, then we'll get more charging stations put in. And it'll be get easier and easier to travel your long distances. Um, and so, yeah, the sky's it'll the limit on this. It'll happen. It's happening. It's here, folks. We talk about wearable tech uh, for tracking various health bits, and Bob's here at Tech Talk quite a bit. But one variable that's been a bit elusive to date so far has been measuring our blood pressure. Up to now, blood pressure monitoring has been required with a sphygmomanometer. I'll say that one more time, sphygmomanometer. It's a comparatively bulky device with an inflatable cuff and tubes that pump air from a clunky data logger. But that's all set to change. It's finally here. We've got a simple clip and a smartphone app. Is that right, Matt? I just put this story in because I know how much you love to say that word, which I'm not even going to attempt. <laughs> it sounds like a lyric out of a Muppet song. <laughs> it does. <laughs> or Mary Poppins or something, singing some sort of song. So, <laughs> so what we've got now, we do talk about it a little bit, and there is some fascinating developments occurring in this space, but getting to the stage where wearables, things in our body are monitoring our health to a whole range of different areas. And one of the things, and you can buy some pretty flash cuffs that are connected up with Bluetooth to your phone, so you kind of feel like you're getting something that you can put on, but you still got to put the cuff up on there and it okay, blows up. Needs, and, yeah, it needs to blow up. It needs something to, uh, to pump that air in. Yeah, so you can get some pretty advanced ones of those, and then you can read the details on your phone, but it's still all a bit clumsy. This here is a forerunner to something that I firmly believe will be built into future models of phones. It's a clip that effectively goes over your camera, and then you just hold your finger over the clip, which is using your camera, and it's actually looking at the blood pressure via just your finger. Mm. Now, that sounds pretty impressive. And if I go back many years, when you used to have to check heart rate, well, I suppose many, many years ago, someone would actually hold their fingers on your wrist and listen or, or feel for that while they looked at a watch and just timed it out. And then you got the stage where someone came up with this broad idea of maybe chest bands, but then you go into a hospital now and you've got the little clip that goes over your finger that yeah. does your... Reads the oxygen uh, content oxygen as well. And, that's right, and the heart rate. That's called a pulse oximeter. 
there you go. Look, I'm, you're throwing them all out now. And so <laughs> I should be a doctor. <laughs> this year, <laughs> that's part of the training, isn't it? Now, pronounce these words. That's part of our test. So this year allows you, just by holding your finger over the camera or over this clip, just to check that blood pressure by looking at what's going through the blood in your finger. So that sounds quite fascinating yeah. to me. But again, this is a clip that you put on there, a very cheap clip, but surely there'll be one that comes along before too much longer. And I can remember many years ago, it was pretty exciting, an app came out that could do your heart rate by putting your finger over the camera on your phone. Mm. And of course, then we got to the stage where watchers did it and all the rest of it. But this now, putting your finger over that, and again, if you think your blood pressure is not quite right, go and see a doctor, make sure you get proper testing with proper equipment done, but it gives you an indication. But more importantly, you can do that daily, for example. Do it twice a day if you want, or in situations where you think your blood pressure might be pushed higher than normal. So just check your blood pressure. Right, I've got to get out of the situation. My blood pressure is high. But the other thing that doctors tell me is that sometimes they get false readings from people in their surgery because it creates a bit of anxiety when they walk into the doctor's surgery and sit down, and just that alone creates readings, either whether it be heart rate or blood pressure readings that aren't accurate because you're sitting in a doctor's surgery. It mm. might make you a bit nervous or anxious. So this sort of thing is fascinating, developing these little processes. Our phone has just got so much power in what it can actually do now. Absolutely. Well, people, it's happened again. ChatGPT, the faceless AI research and writing tool, has fallen into hot water one more time. ChatGPT has proved to be a popular tool in legal circles, disintegrating the number of research hours required in trying cases to nearly nothing. But it appears that ChatGPT is not entirely reliable, and it's gotten one New York-based lawyer up to his neck in strife. Matt, it seems that there's still an important place for a paralegal in the justice system. I've got to double some, check the reading. Just do some common sense, maybe. It's quite fascinating. Chat GPT was only launched in November last year. Yeah. We seem to talk about a story almost every week with Chat GPT at the moment. It seems to be a real buzz around. And so this lawyer, and we've talked before about some legal firms use it for some of their initial advice and just get some of the work done. And then they just go and check it and make sure it's all okay. This lawyer got a bit excited and a bit carried away. And he was using it in a personal injury case against an airline. Now, you can imagine an airline's probably going to make sure they have some fairly reasonable solicitors because they don't really want a personal injury case found against the airline. Yeah. And this guy, defending this one particular person or probably bringing the action forward for this one particular person, oh, I don't have time for this. I'll just go and get ChatGPT to write my whole case, basically. <laughs> Presented that to the defense counsel. And they went through that and said, look, some of the cases that you've brought up here, some, some of the... Precedents. The, yeah, some of the precedents. I, I can't find those. Can you tell me what court that was in or where that's been referred to? And, of course, he went, oh, well, look, the research said it was there, so it must be there. And he almost dismissed it as if, just go and look harder. And so the Defence Council kept looking harder and harder, and they couldn't find it. And what they found was that Chat GPT, I want to say made it up, but I'll go a bit deeper in that, but let's say made it up for the moment. I think made a up. TV script or something like that. And that's exactly the problem. Oh, really? I don't think it was a TV script, but the problem with ChatGPT is it doesn't know what's real and what's not real. So yeah. one of the really important things when you're telling your students to go and research something is make sure you've got a couple of different sources of that. Yeah. Make sure it just hasn't been someone quoting the same person and all of this because that first one might have been wrong. But ChatGPT is a natural language tool. It doesn't really know when someone's put misinformation out. It doesn't know whether it might be a TV script, for example. It just knows, oh, I've got these examples here, so I'll use those because I've found them on the internet. The old joke about, oh, it must be right, it's on the internet. And chat deputies use that for the precedents for these previous legal cases and quoted those. Of course, they don't exist. They're not yeah. real legal cases. So you can imagine <laughs> the solicitors going, oh, well, I thought everything that AI gave me was going to be real. I thought it would be absolutely rock solid. That's no defence, mate. No, that's right. <laughs> now, he's in a bit of trouble. He's actually going to have to appear before a court himself and wow. argue why he shouldn't be suspended. I don't think he'll, he'll be disbarred forever, but he might get a suspension for being so careless and clumsy. Yeah, and, that's really and clumsy stupid. by <laughs> definition, isn't it? It is. And also wasting a bunch of time for the other side 
who have had to go through and try and find these legal cases that do not exist. Well, can you imagine being represented by this guy <laughs> and going, yeah, and he's saying, yeah, we've got a rock solid case. I've got all these precedents and all the, I've, I've done all the research. Well, I haven't done the research. I've <laughs> That's right. had some artificial intelligence do but, it for me. But these cases look pretty good, don't they? <laughs> so they, they add to our case, absolutely. Oh, so it is quite fascinating. But I suppose one of those things, look, I use chat here for different, different things. I, I love trying out and seeing how it can work from time to time. But you always want to just check it. Give it the common sense check. Go on, look it up mm-hmm. somewhere else. Just make sure you're comfortable with that information. For a while now, a big argument against the EV revolution has been about the extent of the environmental damage done in the production stage. Well, a thorough audit has been done. And Matt, you're certainly not surprised with the outcome. Not surprised. I suppose I'm surprised in... It's not quite as strong as I might have thought it would have been in favour of EVs, but it was a very conservative process they undertook. So what they did was they said, let's compare the same sized car in an internal combustion engine car and uh, EV and just see how that impacts the environment. Now, the first thing that I often see when I see people critical of EVs, they say, oh, no, look at all the things you had to mine to make this car. And lithium and cobalt come pretty much um, up Trump's first of all. They, they do, but, but people also talk about just all the mining had to happen. Hmm. And I didn't realise that internal combustion engine vehicles, you just clicked your fingers and hmm. they magically appeared out yeah. of thin air. Apparently, I, I always go mining. back to when they, when they come to that, I just say, you've just described mining. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's what happens with normal vehicles. Normal vehicles have got things in them that had to come from mining. Well, so, not only that, but your kettle and, you know, your, the, the, I don't know if people still use an iron, but the tools you're using in the bathroom and in the kitchen and all that sort of stuff, they all came from mining. That's right. And it's if just, you want to quantify absolutely every little part of it. It's as if an EV was the first thing ever to be made from mining, first yeah. of all. So yeah. that's kind of the first thing that I often say to people is that, yes, there was mining used to produce this EV, the same as I've normally used cars as an example, but I'm going to steal your idea now, the same as everything else that you use yeah. day to day, they're all using some form of mining to get those raw materials to make those products. We're talking into microphones here that have got metal in them that came from a mine somewhere. Oh, my gosh, how terrible us. are we? Yeah. So the first thing is, how much extra mining, I suppose that's the thing, how much extra environmental damage or carbon emissions was created by building an EV, and then when do you get to the changeover point? Now, what I liked about this report was that it used the worst-case scenario and said, let's assume that all the power you're going to use for this comes from coal-fired power, because it's a pretty easy argument when you start using renewable power for all your power, but that's not... Reasonable, not everyone ticks the box on their electricity bill, not everyone has solar panels. So let's take worst case scenario. So they talked about that and they said around about the payback time. So yes, you've got more carbon emissions building the car in the first place. So you're behind the eight ball compared to a normal internal combustion engine. But then as you go along, burning oil, burning petrol or diesel compared to coal fired power using electricity, you get to the stage of about 30,000 kilometers is the changeover point. So if you get to the stage where you drive your car for 10,000 kilometres and then destroy it, well, yes, you did have more damage to the environment. But if you get 30,000 kilometres and you think about it, most cars get past 30,000 kilometres, then you're in front from an environmental perspective. When you get to the end of the life, and that was the other thing that I thought was an interesting one, they talked about the end of life of a car of being around about 300,000 kilometres. So... I've seen cars, I've driven cars myself that have had more than 300,000 kilometres mm. on them. So that's probably a fairly conservative estimate again. So they said, let's take that example of an internal combustion engine vehicle, an EV, 300,000 kilometres, and that's it. You then scrap it. You throw it away and say that's never going to be used again. Well, your EV using coal-fired power had a, 50 per- a 57% reduction in in greenhouse gas emissions compared to the internal combustion engine vehicle. So that seems fairly comprehensive. The only thing I would have liked to have seen from this report was to do all those calculations again, but using purely renewable power. Mm. Because some people that do have an EV do have solar panels or they do tick the box of the electricity bill. So you do have that scenario. But as a worst case scenario, anyone out there with an EV can feel pretty comfortable in that in the worst case, they're going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 57%. 
fairly significant, I would have thought. I think that's quite significant. And the other one that uh, people like to come up with is, uh, well, what are you going to do with the battery when um, the battery is no longer efficient? And we've talked about that before, about uh, the work going into looking into converting those into batteries can be used in houses. So I think there's a, a process there that you'll use them for a certain amount of time in an EV, and then you'll reuse, exactly as you said, probably in a household scenario, and then you'll recycle. And recyclers are at the stage where they're in the high 90% of what they can actually recycle from their battery, Mm. maybe 97, maybe 98% of their battery. But again, I go to the flip side, you take an internal combustion engine, when it's done well, 300,000 kilometres internal combustion engine, they're normally not going that well after that. What do you do with all that metal then? Sure, you can melt it down and recycle it, but you're not going to get every individual component of that melted down into something else. So mm. you're probably getting a higher percentage of the battery being able to be recycled at the end of the day than you are from an internal combustion engine. What are you doing with all that sump oil and all that other stuff that comes yeah. out too? Yeah, that's right. And now I know that a lot of tips, when you take things out to your tip, you've got to identify those certain things like the oil. What do they do with that oil? They're trying to keep it out of landfill, out of the various waste streams. So there's a, mm. a lot of work to be done and all that. And yeah, you don't see all of that oil in a normal EV. So mm. yeah, anyway, look, it's it's quite heartening. It's kind of, as you said, what we already know, but it's good to see an independent report done to give some credibility, some extra credibility to the the things that most people already know logically. For sure. And there's the full-time whistle, folks. Thank you, linesmen. Thank you, ball boys. Thank you, scorers. And thank you, supporters. And well done, coach. That was another cracking tech talk. Thank you. I better go and look around the house now and see what I can claim on my tax. <laughs> well, I'm going to head home now in my highly popular Model Y, even more confident in the knowledge that I've made the right decision on that front. And maybe I'll head home and check that my son is putting some important necessary hours into Fortnite and Rocket League or Overwatch or what have you. Thanks for tuning in again, folks. We hope you got something useful out of today's episode of Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. And you are leveraging yourself into the future just a little bit ahead of the Joneses who are living next door. I'm James Eddy. As always, it's been a pleasure to bring you our humble little podcast. And we hope to catch you and your mum and dad and all your friends and even some of your workmates next time. Until then, take care and we'll see you in a week.